afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to City Hall. Oh, that's a little close. Um, in our monthly Hungry for History program. If I haven't met you before, I'm Luciana Spraker, director of the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives. And we're always happy to have um, another great speaker for our monthly programming. And um, before we dive into today's program, I wanted to make sure you are aware of a special event we have coming up tomorrow. I've put a little flyer in front of you. We'll be opening our new exhibit, Five Years That Changed Savannah Forever, Reflecting on the Civil Rights Movement Through the WW Law Photograph Collection. That's going to be over at the Savannah Cultural Arts Center, which is on Montgomery Street. We're going to have an opening reception starting at 5.30 p.m. This exhibit documents five of the most turbulent um, years of the civil rights movement, 1960 to 65, through the lens of W.W. W. Law's work as president of the Savannah branch of the NAACP. Um, we had a guest curator working with us, that's former mayor um, Dr. Otis Johnson. Um, he is also going to be with us tomorrow night for a special program starting at 6 p.m. Um, that'll be a discussion where we talk with him about why he selected certain images, what's going on in those images, um, his memories of certain events that he was there to participate in. He's going to talk about WW Law and um, how Mr. Law influenced him and others in the civil rights movement. And um, I think it's going to be a really interesting and exciting program. So I hope you can join us tomorrow. If you can't, that exhibit will be on display through Saturday, December 14th at the Cultural Arts Center. But let's talk about today's program. I'm really excited about it. Um, and it's Atomic Ranch, Mid-Century Subdivision Development in Oglethorpe's Colonial Capital. We're joined by Bob Susevich to my right here. Bob is an author, lecturer, and historic preservationist. He's the principal of Quatrefoil Historic Preservation Consulting. And I've, ha I've had the benefit of working with him as he has provided consulting services for city and county governments, federal agencies, community groups, and private individuals throughout Georgia on a variety of projects. He's worked with local and regional organizations to promote awareness of and advocate for the preservation of Savannah's rich collection of modern architecture, which is why I reached out to him, because I really think we need to start looking more at our modern architecture. And he's prepared the successful National Register nominations for Fairway Oaks Greenview and Kensington Park Groveland Historic Districts. He's also prepared the pending nomination for Magnolia Park Blueberry Hill Historic District. And as we're now 19 years into the 21st century, I think it's important that we start paying attention to the 20th century's history and the architecture. So I'm really glad that he's sort of, you know, taking up this work and, um, and helping to document this period of our history. So with that, I want to turn it over to Bob and Atomic Ranch. Thank you. The Ranch House. You don't need to be an architectural historian to identify this most ubiquitous of house types. If you're around my age, chances are you either grow up in a ranch house or live in one now. Ranch house subdivisions were everywhere in the suburban environs of 1950s, 60s, and 70s America. So how could something so well-preserved, excuse me, represented in our built environment be architecturally significant and worthy of preservation? In my experience growing up in Savannah, Anything less than 100 years old was not considered historic. Growing up on Savannah's suburban south side in a 1958 ranch house further added to my perception of what was old and therefore significant and worthy of preservation and what was new. The recent past was a relatively new concept when I first attended graduate school for historic preservation during the early 1990s. At that time, the recent past was the 1940s as buildings and structures from this period, we're just reaching the age threshold of 50 years to qualify for historic eligibility. In graduate school, and as a young professional, at least in my experience, there was an indifference towards modern and mid-century architecture. The works of the master architects of the modern movement were acknowledged but not dwelled upon, with the exception of Frank Lloyd Wright and a few others. There was a general sense that there were so many significant historic resources to deal with already that we should worry about modernism later. There's so much of it. In regards to the ordinary ranch house and the common mid-modern commercial building, there is an undisguised negativity, even among uh, preservation professionals. One of my professors at the University of Georgia, a real pioneer in the historic preservation movement in the state, 
and one of what I refer to as the first generation of historic preservation professionals, when asked by a student, what about ranch houses, are they significant? His reply, when the ranch is 50 years old, I'll retire. <laughs> as a young preservation professional working in the field during the 1990s, ranch subdivisions were written off. We were told that we didn't need to deal with these. As the year 2000 approached and the significance of the year 1950 loomed, I started to question if I and we as a, as a profession should start including ranch in late 1940s housing as part of our survey work. Often to be rebuffed by client municipalities that would say they would rather make sure all the truly significant buildings are covered. Let's not worry about that other stuff. It's modern and there's plenty of it and is it even historic? Nevertheless, by the early 2000s, I started including representative examples of ranch houses in my survey work, as well as some early 1950s commercial and institutional buildings. I was still unsure, however, if our present means of survey and register was appropriate for the ubiquitous ranch and other mid-century architecture. What finally convinced me at, that at least ranch houses were important was the realization that my grandma's house would be 50 years old in 2003. For others, Grandma's house, or at least I imagined, was a wonderful old Victorian house downtown or a two-story colonial revival in a midtown early 20th century subdivision. My Grandma's house, however, was a 1953 ranch house in one of Savannah's first ranch developments. To me, this is a great old house. My mother and uncle grew up here and it was where we spent every holiday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, that I could remember. My grandparents had this house built and she had spent 50 years here. Surely grandma's house was significant. So I decided to approach this objectively and use my grandma's house as a case study of sorts to solve this mid-modern dilemma, for myself at least, and found that my grandma's neighborhood had an interesting and compelling developmental history and represented a significant chapter in Savannah's Cold War history, that the house itself displayed a variety of architectural characteristics unique unto itself. Abercorn Heights subdivision is one of, of several small subdivisions built north of Duran Avenue during the late 1940s and early 1950s. While these subdivisions still use the traditional grid plan, the lots were larger, sidewalks were dispensed with, and houses were all set back on the lots. And all the houses were ranch houses, making this neighborhood the earliest concentration of ranch houses in the city. Most of the houses in the neighborhood exhibit the same quality of materials, siding, and diversity of design as the bungalow neighborhoods of the 1920s and 1930s. These houses seem to me to possess a conviction of design worthy of preservation. Most of the houses feature low-pitched hip roofs with overhanging box eaves, paired and triple six over six and eight over eight wood windows, decorative wrought iron porch railings, and handsome door surrounds, often evoking elements of the colonial revival style. Interiors feature decorative mantles, hardwood floors, wood paneled studies and dens, late period art deco hardware, and French doors that open onto a uh, paneled screen in porch overlooking the backyard. So architecturally, Grandma's house and its neighbors appeared to pass muster in terms of significance. But what about contextually? What significant role does the ranch house and its associated subdivision developments play in the development of Savannah during this time? During World War II, in the beginning of the 1950s, a large concentration of military installations and defense-related industries had been established in Savannah. In order to accommodate the crush of temporary uh, defense-related industries, um, in order to excuse, uh, accommodate the crush of temporary defense workers that came to Savannah during this time, several people rented out rooms in their homes or converted their townhouses into duplexes. By the early 1950s, the advent of the Cold War made several defense-related industries in the area permanent and the need for permanent housing became dire, which of course led to the proliferation of new modern ranch subdivisions on the outskirts of the city, like Abercorn Heights. My grandparents were part of that immigration of defense workers to the area, having moved from New Jersey to Savannah in the early 1950s to work in the vending business. My grandfather and his partner had won a government contract to supply and service all the vending machines at Fort Stewart and Hunter Air Force Base. During this time, Hunter Field was a SAC base, SAC being short for Strategic Air Command. One of a handful of airfields across the country tasked with the mission of delivering atomic bombs in our nation's fight against communism. Like many civilian defense workers and their families, my grandparents had their home built in a new subdivision located close to the base. 
Like many patriotic Americans locally and nationally, my grandparents were involved with the local Civil Defense Council in order to be prepared for a possible nuclear attack. My grandfather, who had top secret clearance at Hunter and Fort Stewart, where he worked, was reminded daily of the possibility of nuclear assured destruction if the United States was to go to war with the USSR. My grandma volunteered at the filter station with the Ground Observation Corps identifying and logging incoming aircraft to ensure that they were friendlies, while my grandfather, trained as a volunteer fireman in Basket Ridge, New Jersey, would help as part of the fire brigade in case of the aftermath of an air attack. And pictured here are some of the local and federal civil defense manuals that my grandparents kept on hand during the 1950s when the threat of a war was still very real and air raid drills were a common occurrence. During the 1970s, the civil defense instruction sheet was still taped to the back of my grandma's pantry door. I remember going to the kitchen to get my morning cereal and weekend, on weekend sleepovers and seeing this next to the Rice Krispies, which is kind of scary. <laughs> So I followed up my little case study with a short article entitled Considering the Significance of the Ranch Style House, which was published in a newsletter of a small statewide architectural group. I was contacted later by staff of the Historic Preservation Division who had read the article and they had let me know that they were beginning to work on a statewide context on the development of the ranch house in Georgia and that they were interested in including what I was working on here in South Georgia. A few months later, Historic Savannah Foundation put me in contact with the board of the Fairway Oaks Association, who were worried about the adverse effect of the proposed Duran Parkway project on their neighborhood and adjacent neighborhoods. The proposed project would widen Duran Avenue from Bull Street to the Truman Parkway and would necessitate the demolition of all the houses on the south side of Duran Avenue from Abercorn Street to Skidaway Road. The existing perimeter road would become an additional lane and former building lots would become a linear park. Over 100 ranch houses would be demolished in the process. The Fairway Oaks Association hoped to have their neighborhood listed on the National Register as the designation would give a measure of protection for any federally funded project, such as a road widening, uh, through the Historic Preservation Act of 1966. The members of the Fairway Oaks Association knew that their subdivision was one of the first true mid-century subdivisions in Savannah to have a plan with curvilinear streets, cul-de-sacs, and wooded lots of varying sizes. Yet they still conceded, we know we're not historic like downtown. But still, they felt that their neighborhood had value and significance. I would soon find out that this was indeed true, and that this linear development of subdivisions along the south side of Duran Avenue between Abercorn Street and Skidaway Road represented the first upscale mid-century subdivisions in Savannah, having been developed roughly from 1950 to 1953. After some investigation and consultation with the Historic Preservation Division in Atlanta, it was determined that the subdivision was indeed eligible for listing on the National Register as a historic district. One of the many firsts for Fairway Oaks as this would be the first attempt in Georgia to list a mid-century subdivision on the National Register, which would have been unthinkable just a few years earlier. Not only was the subdivision completely intact, it boasted one of the earliest and best collections of mid-century houses in the city including split levels, site-specific architect-designed homes, American small house, and of course ranch houses. While in the process of writing preparing the nomination, it was discovered that the Fairway Oaks Association, which was formed in 1950, was the first homeowners association in Savannah among the and among the first in Georgia, a somewhat rare distinction as the HOA would not become commonplace nationally for several years. For some context, there were only 600 registered HOAs in the nation in 1960, of which Kensington Park Association and Magnolia Park were also among that 600. In 2009, the Fairway Oaks Greenview Historic District was listed on the National Register. It was the first mid-century subdivision in Georgia and among the first in the nation to be listed on the National Register. 2010, the Historic Preservation Division published an award-winning statewide context that detailed the developmental history and outlined the significance of the ranch house in Georgia. The listing of Fairway X in the National Register and Collier Heights in Atlanta shortly thereafter not only provided validity to the significance of the ranch house, but also to that of modern architecture in general. The listing of Fairway Oaks paved the way for the acceptance locally of the validity of other mid-century buildings, such as office buildings, hospitals, schools, fire stations, as being significant and worthy of preservation. 
As a result, several mid-century buildings were successfully rehabilitated downtown using historic tax credits, with the latest being the former Broughton Street Municipal Building. This new understanding of the significance of mid-century historic resources would not have been possible without going through the National Register process enlisting Fairway Oaks, as it necessitated the research into the preparation of the post-World War II Cold War developmental history of Savannah. Which leads me to the second part of my talk, in which I'll outline the local, regional, and national significance of the ranch house and mid-century subdivisions, which provided the basis for making the case for listing Fairway Oaks and later Kensington Park in 2014, and recently Magnolia Park in the National Register of Historic Places. Author Alan Hess, in his book, The Ranch House, describes the ranch as, quote, a thoroughly modern architecture possibly the most modern of all. Few other residential building types are spread so widely and provide decent housing to so many, chiefly on the strength of modern building techniques, materials, and systems. Modernists had dreamt of this possibility from the beginning, but never achieved it so widely. He goes on to say, quote, the ranch house is the dominant residence type of the American century. Few building types ever house as many Americans. The ranch moderated the strident lines and images of early 20th century European modernism at the same time that it used the liberating power of modern technology to make these homes affordable as well reachable in the automobile." End quote. In Savannah, ranch houses were initially introduced during the late 1940s and very early 1950s as infill within the already established neighborhoods such as Ardsley Park, Ardmore, Chatham Crescent, and Leolin Heights. Common local characteristics included metal casement windows and the use of savanna gray brick for exterior cladding. These early ranch houses, sometimes called minimal or bungalow ranches, are somewhat boxier and less sprawling than that of the iconic suburban ranch of the 1950s, due in part to the limited size of the building lots available at the time. Unlike this, this and the next um, sprawling example, which were built on multiple lots that happened to be available and contiguous. The development of the ranch house in its historic setting, the modern suburban uh, subdivision, was greatly influenced by the necessity of large-scale federal war housing projects at sites across the nation and by guidelines of the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA. Wartime housing developments, such as San Lorenzo Village in California, created a template for the mass-produced housing to come in the boom years of the 1950s. The largesse of jobs gave modern architects opportunities to build on a larger scale than before and to apply and refine building systems based on modules and prefabrication. Significant lessons and experience were also learned by developers during this time who built with the aid of Title VII allocations that funneled material and labor to defense-related housing. They honed their mass building skills in defense housing and then directly applied those valuable lessons to the numerous ranch houses in the decades after the war. Two local examples of large-scale wartime housing developments are Pine Gardens here in Savannah and Brunswick Villa in Glynn County, both built as housing for the workers employed at shipyards constructing Liberty ships. Pine Gardens consisted of 500 single houses, single family houses, while associated apartment complexes Deadford Place, Moses Rogers Grove, and Hosiah Tattnall Homes provided an additional 1,750 housing units, all built within uh, seven months. The, the Federal Housing Administration, who was tasked with improving housing standards and conditions, as well as providing an adequate home financing system, ensured that all the housing built within these wartime developments were constructed following FHA guidelines for the minimum house to ensure that their building loans would be approved. Edgemere, Poplar Heights, and Ridgewood are all examples of 1940s era FHA approved housing developments in Savannah that embody the minimum house approach. Following the end of World War II, Savannah, like most communities throughout the nation, was faced with a severe housing shortage coupled with a sharp increase in population. Between 1940 and 1950, Savannah's population increased 24%. Aided by the FHA, Savannah entered into a decade-long building boom that resulted in the establishment of several new subdivisions on the south and east sides of the city, and the subsequent expansion of the city limits from 60th Street Lane to Duran Avenue on the south, 
and from B Road and the Casey Canal to Skidaway Road on the east. Influenced by national trends, the Savannah real estate community started to break with traditional development patterns during this time and began adopting more contemporary practices, marking a transition between pre-war development and the Cold War era subdivisions of the early 1950s. Although residential subdivision developments continued the use of the grid pattern plan of streets and rear access lanes, building lots offered during this time were generally larger, houses were set back farther on lots, and the construction of sidewalks were largely discontinued. Now, as you can see here, this is um, Ardmore, and it was uh, developed in 1925. The houses are closer together. There's a, um, a street lawn, a, a tree lawn, and also sidewalks. And you can see how closely sited the buildings are to the street, as opposed to Abercorn Heights, uh, which is 1949. Houses are set far back from the um, street. There's no sidewalks and no street lawn. Among Savannah's first post-World War II residential developments, Abercorn Park, Abercorn Heights, Brookwood, Lamara Heights, and Manor Estates represent collectively one of the earliest and most significant concentration of ranch houses in Savannah. Abercorn Park, developed in 1949, was one of the first subdivisions to offer larger lots. Savannah Morning News article announcing the opening of the subdivision identified this aspect as a key feature of the development, commenting that, quote, the realtors have departed from the 60-foot frontage, which is traditional with Savannah's real estate, and are restricting our Abercorn Park's land packages to 70-foot and 90-foot frontages with a depth of 120 feet, end quote. Although the development was small, consisting of only 34 home sites along the one and a half blocks of 60th Street, it was significant as it helped set several precedents. As well as offering a variety of larger lot sizes, houses were set back farther from the street as a result of increased lot depth, and sidewalks were dispensed with. In addition, the expanded width and depth of the lots were ideal for the sprawling design of the ranch house. By 1952, similar subdivisions were established along Abercorn Street immediately south of Abercorn Park, Abercorn Heights, and Manor Estates, which continued this pattern of development on both sides of, of, the, of Abercorn Street from 61st Street to Duran Avenue. As a result of these favorable characteristics, the area represents one of the earliest concentrations of ranch houses in Savannah. Lamara Heights, also developed in 1949, was the largest and most significant subdivision of the late 1940s. Located between 60th Street Lane and 65th Street on the north and south and Reynolds and Habersham Streets, on the east and west, respectively, the subdivision was located in the heart of Savannah's post-war area of development. The new subdivision was developed by the Lamara Company, the same group who developed Abercorn Park, and was organized in 1949 to, quote, undertake land development and simultaneously pursue an active construction program, end quote. According to a Savannah Morning News article that announced the opening of the subdivision, Lamara Heights was, quote, the largest development in 10 years and made available the much needed home sites for Savannah's e extension." End quote. Although the company intended the development to be in keeping with the pre-war planning of Savannah's residential developments, as stated in the press, the developers adopted the same pattern of development, larger lots, deeper setback, no sidewalks, for Lamara Heights as they had used in Abercorn Park earlier that year, while taking their concept for a modern residential subdivision one step farther. As reported in the Savannah Morning News, quote, a portion of the new subdivision was deeded to the city for a grammar school and park area. In addition to educational facilities, a suburban business district will be created at the northwest end of the new subdivision, end quote. As a result, J.G. Smith Elementary School was established in the upper northwest corner of the development, while Lamara Heights Shopping Center, now Haversham Village, was built between 61st and 63rd Streets, essentially creating a commercial corridor along this section of Haversham Street. The Lamar Company was one of the first land developers in Savannah to embrace FHA principles by taking a multiple-use multiple approach in planning residential subdivisions and perhaps the first to tie in the now ubiquitous sh uh, suburban shopping center into a residential subdivision plan. In 1950, Lamar, the Lamar Company added a multiple family dimension to their multi-use development through the establishment of the FHA-approved Lamara Apartments, 
a large multi-unit 30-acre complex of duplex bungalows loca located on the corner of Duran Avenue and Habersham Street, immediately south of Lamar Heights. Along with the Abercorn Terrace Apartments and the Nelson Apartments, Lamar Apartments provided affordable housing for young, growing middle-class families within a convenient suburban environment. According to a Savannah Morning News article that announced the new development, entitled 150-Unit Housing Project Plan, Second Big Development Announced for South End, the Lamar Apartments featured the first three-bedroom apartments in Georgia to be authorized for construction by the Federal Housing Administration. The article points out that, quote, the three-bedroom units are designed especially to meet the urgent needs of large families. The development will be situated only eight-tenths of a mile from Hunter Field, which will soon become an Air Force base. In 1951, Hunter Air Force Base became the home of the 38th Air Division of the Strategic Air Command, which is made up of the 2nd and 308th Bomb Wings. The initial establishment of the base brought a complement of 4,600 officers and airmen and their families to Savannah, as well as civilian defense workers whose skills were needed to help with the day-to-day -day operations of the facility. This number increased to 7,000 with the addition of the second bomb wing in 1952. The apartments provided much needed housing for these servicemen and their families. Built in 1947, the Abercorn Terrace Apartments was particularly popular with single officers stationed at the base. Abercorn Terrace was the first FHA approved townhouse apartments in Georgia. After 1950, Savannah real estate developers accepted a new standard for residential development that broke with the traditional pre-war mode of planning that had for the most part been employed up to this point. Rather than continuing the standard grid pattern of landscape streets and uniform lot sizes, Savannah's developers fully adopted the FHA's preferred pattern for subdivision development and began offering new subdivisions that featured large wooded lots of varying shapes and sizes set among a series of curvilinear streets. The subdivision pattern traces its roots to the mid-19th century, although it didn't become widespread throughout the country until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In Georgia, Atlanta's Druid Hills, which was initially planned by Frederick Law Olmsted, was one of the first picturesque subdivisions in the state. The first golf course subdivisions also followed this pattern and have continued to do so to this day. Brookhaven in North Atlanta, developed in 1910, was one of the first golf subdivisions in the southeast to employ this pattern. During the 1930s, the FHA had adopted the pattern and many of its characteristics as a preferred subdivision pattern, which spawned many new developments with first the American small house and then ranch houses. It appears that the Savannah real estate community was initially slow to accept the FHA's model subdivision pattern as practically all of the new residential developments built during the late 1940s building boom were a continuation of the pre-war grid plan. One exception was Forest Hill Subdivision, a neighborhood of basic American small houses developed in 1947. Located on the northeast corner of Skidaway Road and Duran Avenue within the city limits, Forest Hills appears to be the first example in Savannah of a subdivision utilizing the FHA's approved subdivision pattern. Groveland, Kensington Park, Fairway Oaks, and Magnolia Park were the first upscale subdivisions in Savannah to adopt the FHA's subdivision model. All four of these subdivisions border Duran Avenue on the north and are located adjacent one another between Abercorn Street and Skidaway Road. In addition to proximity and, and geographic location, these subdivisions share other similarities as they all had been developed to, quote, fulfill a widespread demand for large wooded home sites in an urban setting, in which each building lot has been planned for the maximum scenic effort, effect and its outlook on the winding streets, end quote. Each of these subdivisions share, shared many common characteristics and was marketed in a similar way. A brochure created by the Lamara Company for Magnolia Park could easily be used to describe any of these subdivisions. Quote, Magnolia Park subdivision has been created to fulfill the demand for better type homes, which have large lots and a plenty of trees. For the first time in many years, an area strategically located directly in the path of the city's growth has been selected, planned, and developed to provide large home sites, each studded with magnificent trees, conveniently located to schools, shopping centers, and public transportation, end quote. 
Of these subdivisions, Fairway Oaks was thought to be the most exclusive and featured some of the most well-appointed houses displaying the very latest and modern domestic design to be found in suburban Savannah during the 1950s. It was the first subdivision developed south of Durant Avenue and was the earliest upscale subdivision in Savannah to feature large wooded lots of varying shape and sizes set among a series of curvilinear streets. The location of the subdivision outside the Savannah city limits provided the illusion of country living, while its development adjacent the municipal golf course at Bacon Park provided a country club atmosphere, an effect that was intentional as Bacon Park Drive once served as the entrance to the municipal golf links. The name of the development, Fairway Oaks, derives from its location adjacent to the fifth hole of the Live Oak uh, course, which serves as the southern border of the subdivision and is overlooked by the houses situated along Bacon Park Drive. Along with Kensington Park and Magnolia Park, Fairway Oaks was considered one of the most progressive communities of its era and was the home of some of the most significant business and civic leaders of the 1950s and 60s Savannah. Fairway Oaks also has the distinction, as I mentioned earlier, of having one of the earliest homeowners associations in Georgia, the Fairway Oaks Association. In 2009, Fairway Oaks Greenview became the first mid-century modern subdivision in Georgia and among the first in the nation to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Groveland and Kensington Park were developed at the same time as Fairway Oaks and was listed on the National Register in 2014. This ad for Kensington Park depicts four tract houses designed by Ralph S. Thomas, one of the most prolific designers of tract housing in Savannah. During the mid-1950s, Savannah builder Clayton Powell teamed up with architect Ralph S. Thomas and began introducing the type of quality, mass-produced post and beam houses that were already built, being built in subdivisions throughout California. Influenced by the California modern style espoused by home builder Joseph Eichler, who first introduced mid-century modern architecture to the middle class during the early 1950s, by offering architect design, mass-produced homes at affordable prices for the average family, Powell began to employ the same type of mass production techniques being used by large-scale track housing uh, developers throughout the country. The August 1955 edition of House and Home magazine outlined the efficient methods Powell used to streamline the building process in order to provide the best quality product at the most economically feasible price, all in 24 working days. The Eichler-inspired ranch house showcased in the magazine pictured at the bottom here is located in Sylvan Terrace. And here's a similar post and beam ranch in Kensington Park, as well as an outstanding contemporary style track house, also in Kensington, exhibiting the shed subtype. Powell was not the only builder in Savannah to offer architect design mass produced post and beam track housing. John Ahern, the founder and president of the National Association of Home Builders, was also a prolific and well-known builder in the area who built many of the houses in Fairway Oaks, Magnolia Park, and various other developments. Located in close proximity to John Ahern's Eichler-inspired ranch is the Trade Secrets House of 1953, the unveiling of which was the highlight of the Lamar Company's grand opening of Magnolia Park on November 1, 1953. Constructed by the Powell Construction Company, the Trade Secrets House in 1953 was a wildly publicized spec house featured in Life Magazine and other periodicals that embodied the results of the study of the National Home Builders Association. A committee of some of the nation's outstanding architects created the Trade Secrets House of 1953 as a composite of their ideas for contemporary living. The house was then built in select subdivisions in several cities across the nation, Memphis, Chicago, Miami, Atlanta, Tucson, South Bend, Dallas, Philadelphia, and then 1953, Savannah, as a way of disseminating their new ideas. In 1955, Powell used his knowledge of mass production to establish the first planned large-scale tract housing development in Savannah, Windsor Forest. Together with five other leading builders, including John Ahern, Powell, now the president of the Home Builders Association of Savannah, which he organized, formed a joint venture called the Delta Land Corporation to buy and develop the 100,000 acre tract. Located just six miles from Savannah, the site was big enough to keep all six independent builders busy for years to come while keeping costs low 
by pooling resources to, re to fund the costs of infrastructure and utilities. The master plan of Windsor Forest, shown here, was executed by Eugene Martini and Associates of Atlanta. The gray section on the right indicates the section of Windsor Forest that had already been developed by 1957. A close-up of this developed section, phase A and B, also indicates the location of Country Day School, designed by Bergen and Bergen in 1957. It was common for developers of large-scale housing to promote their products through a parade of homes, in which an entire street of pre-built showcase homes are open to the public, as seen here in this photo for Maryvale Subdivision in Phoenix, Arizona in 1955. Savannah's first annual parade of homes was held at Windsor Forest in 1957 and showcased 13 houses by various builders all on one street. Eight of the 13 houses showcased were designed in the then popular contemporary style, such as this post and beam Eichler inspired house designed by William Bergen. The June 1957 edition of House and Home Magazine, which covered the premiere of Windsor Forest during the 1957 parade of homes, also contained a profile on the home builder community developers and showcased the variety of houses offered by each builder, which in their own words, quote, make Windsor Forest a home buyer's shopping center, end quote. The old brick traditional by Hugh Armstrong was one of only five traditional showcase houses included in the event, indicating the developer's early emphasis on modern design. By 1959, however, it appears that the conservative tastes of Savannah home buyers had already begun to shift back to revival styles if the showcase homes of the 1959 parade of homes also held in Windsor Forest is any indication. Of the 12 showcase houses presented, only two were modern in design. Although this seems to be the trend in Savannah in terms of middle class housing at the end of the 1950s, there were several outstanding site specific architect design mid-century modern houses built throughout Savannah during this time, including such avant-garde examples as the 1959 Wise House at 5606 Sweetbriar Circle in Greenview Subdivision, designed by renowned regional architect Mark Garrison Hampton of the famed Sarasota School of Architecture. And this one, 19, the 1956 Grantham House at 111 Brandywine Road in Manor Estates, designed by architect Daniel Grantham as his personal residence, the 1950 Hunter Harvey House at 109 Brandywine Road in Manor Estates. Designed by Helfrich and Grantham, the house appears reminiscent of Frank Sinatra's Palm Beach residence, the 1947 Twin Palms. And the somewhat contemporary oriental Kaminsky Edel House at 65th and Abercorn Street in Brookwood Annex, designed by Carl Helfrich. And then this one, the 1964 Brooks House at 1234 Lawndale Drive in Greenview, designed by Juan Carlos Bertotto. The California contemporary style Rosenwig House at 213 Oxford Drive in Groveland, architect unknown. And the contemporary style 1956 John Ahern House at 1526 Spalding Road in Magnolia Park which was featured in the National Association of Home Builders Journal of Home Building in 1957. And finally, the 1956 Levy House at 1525 Spalding Road in Magnolia Park, designed by a prolific local architect, Henry Levy, as his personal res residence. So in conclusion, with the recent submission of National Register registration applications for the Magnolia Park and Blueberry Hill neighborhood to the Historic Preservation Division in Atlanta, we as a local community and the preservation profession has come full circle in the ranch house and mid-century subdivision developments here in Savannah. We've come a long way since grandma's house and hopefully we have learned our lesson about the potential significance of the recent past. And with that, I will leave you with this latest conundrum. Constructed in 1969, 50 years ago, Savannah Civic Center has attained the threshold age for evaluating its significance. The National Park Service recently stated that the Savannah Civic Center may obtain significance over time and that its demolition could potentially further threaten the status of the Savannah Landmark Historic District. It is the only example of monumental new formalism in Savannah and likely South Georgia. Stay tuned. Thank you.
Any questions for Bob? Any questions? Um, so I live in one of these neighborhoods that was built off sidewalks and mm -hmm. <laughs> think about it often. Um, is, if you were a builder building these neighborhoods and purposefully deciding not to have sidewalks in the 1940s and 50s, what? what how why, did why did they do that? <laughs> yeah. um, well, it, well, back then, because the, basically you were, the lots were going to be different sizes. I mean, I don't know why they did that with, with the early, the, the, the kind of uh, cold, early Cold War. I don't know why they, they did that, but they were kind of going towards that sort of um, thing, larger lots. They weren't, they were trying to have uh, backyards, more backyards and backyard living, that sort of thing. It was kind of a cultural shift. Um, but also, um, once you got to the 50s curvilinear streets, you wouldn't need sidewalks because everything was so, you know, different. I mean, the varying lots and sizes and stuff like that. I imagine because it was almost that park-like atmosphere. Um, I don't know why they would would give up with that, but I certainly understand why you don't have tree lawns anymore because, you know, with the grid pattern, tree lawns make sense. But you have all those trees spotted all over, every, you know, the development in in the ranch subdivision. So that's probably why they got rid of those. They never explain that in the paper. Okay. <laughs> yes. I had a question. So this was really fascinating, and um, I had a question about one of your slides. That's a, dupe, a replica of an ad, and it talks about yeah. the Monterey home. Mm -hmm. Let me try to get back no. there. You're talking about yeah, it's a Monterey style house um, overlooking Fairwags. Uh, What's in for yes. but it's overlooking. And my question for you is, is Fair that, house. okay, is the Monterey house, is that the name of this house? It's the style. Model? It's the style. Okay. Monterey. I have seen this house as an infill design mm -hmm. all over the place. Like, you probably have seen this one. Park. Yeah. This I'm one, yeah. I mean, specifically I've been in that house, and it's interesting because the, the living quarters are really on the, on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, one that's. You, so would this that one, builder have gone like you would go and say, okay, I just bought these <coughs> three contiguous lots that weren't built on on 48th Street. Yeah. And you go to the builder and he's like, okay, here's the book, go through, and that's one of them, and you would say, okay. Well, you know, basically, like like Ralph Thomas and mm -hmm. Powell. Powell would go to Thomas and say, I need three different styles or types of of housing and that people can pick through mm -hmm. and you know that's that's basically how it worked you know and so that's why a lot of these houses will appear in all these different neighborhoods in fact um, all the houses that they, they were shown in the parade of homes you could find them all in kensington um, fairway oaks magnolia but they were also building being built out there the difference is um, fairway oaks was was really built out very quickly really the style and types of buildings had changed just in a couple of years mm -hmm. so there's more modern -ish stuff in kensington park and magnolia park uh, this is actually something you'd find more in a 40s subdivision mm -hmm. that's a, a little bay and it's supposed to be it's it's his hermitage model mm -hmm. and you can find these there's one in ardsley park um there's one i believe in Bewley. i mean they're all over the place um wow. and he, he was a very prolific designer so yeah. Um, so yes. who was the builder of was the Monterey Home Design? Was that a local architect that designed that, or was that something that they got from someplace else? I, I, the Monterey style was national. Okay. So, but they probably did their own, you know, sort of take on it, mm -hmm. and Savannah sized it. I mean, one thing I didn't point out. Um, I don't. Yeah, this. Yeah, see the Savannah gray brick. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find Savannah gray brick. Yes. This is interesting because in the 50s, what, what happened was it was the pre preferred veneer for nicer homes. So they would go into the lanes of downtown Savannah where everybody was leaving and knock, all, knock down the carriage houses and then build like this. My grandma's house actually had like 19th century brick on the exterior. <laughs> so, you know, part of that house, you know, had pretty neat stuff, I guess. But, yes, ma'am. What is the benefit from having your neighborhood historical preservation? I mean, Insurance-wise and um, limitations to it? Would you like to speak to that? You can. We have the president of the 
Kensington Park over here. Well, I can tell you um, that one of the things we knew is, first of all, is the, the biggest thing is we had to convince the neighbors that it wasn't going to impede their ability to work on their houses or change their houses or anything else. Because a lot of people immediately thought it was going to be like downtown where you couldn't change yeah. anything without going through MPC and a bunch of hoops. Well, that's not what it was. But it also, not only does it give us the prestige, but it also gives us protection against commercial encroachment and things like that. So when they were talking about the Durant project, we had actually considered going in at the same time Fairway Oaks did, but convincing my neighbors was a whole lot harder than Fairway Oaks had, because Bob and I worked for way back then. Easier. <laughs> Many years trying to convince the neighbors. But like if Duran were to suddenly want to, you know, remember they talked about double decorating Duran and doing all these things. This now, the we have to, we are given an extra set of protection through the federal government and the state government that they just can't come and make changes along Duran without considering the historic status of our neighborhood. So they can't just remove houses along the rent, that sort of thing. So we protect the integrity of the homes. But an individual can buy one of these homes and decide, I want something modern and tear it sure. down. And yeah, let me explain that. Nat they yeah, National yeah. Register, yeah, they can now. They can now or they can now? Because well, it's not in a conservation. Yeah, okay. Real, conservation. Like Ardmore yeah. and Marsley Park's a conservation yeah, district. We're doing conservation okay. Conservation. Well, just to explain, National Register is recognition of significance. A local district is protection, meaning you have a board of review and, and that sort of thing, like downtown. So Nash, if you're listed in the National Register and you're a National Register district, you, you, know, you can literally take your house down the next day. Um, but, but that's just to give you an indication of, you can do what you want with your home, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it's recognition, it's not um, uh, protection or prevention or you know, trying to tell you what to do with your home. But it helps to go on mm -hmm. because some parts, just like downtown, was only 50 years old. Right. And, you know, like now that we're historic, and, historic and you can also get tax, tax credits, re tax rehabilitation tax credits. Tax credits. Mm -hmm. If if you're living in your home and you, you need to renovate it and it's 60 years old, you you can get tax credits for that. Not as much as if, if it was income producing, but I will not get into that. <laughs> 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 yes, ma'am. Well, thank you, both of you, because I'm one of those houses on the south side of Duran. Yay! Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, but leaving that slide up, does, does it bother anybody else throughout Savannah that they put shutters on all the houses? All these, like, wouldn't that look so much better without shutters? <laughs> <laughs> Non-functional. Design review. You know, I, I agree with you. Oh, no. They're, they're like screwed to the wall. Oh, no. <laughs> Very functional. <laughs> um, yes. Just, just to get back to the sidewalks, having lived in one of those houses way back then, people didn't walk for exercise, and there was nowhere to walk to. You had to get in your car to go to the grocery store or to shop at a dress shop or wherever. You couldn't walk to any specific destination and walking this exercise wasn't popular and all these houses have garages or carports mm. so everybody had a car. I think it was also yeah. design, from a design standpoint I think also it was the idea of having your own land you know when you're in town you have a little plot and the, the, yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah, the house yeah, takes yeah, up the entire like thing. The, like the, almost yeah. like the Right. I hadn't thought about that, but that's exactly what that is. That's exactly what, yeah. Something else, Bob, and you know, I have the privilege of having a lot of the original homeowners mm -hmm. still living in the houses when I moved in there, and a lot of them told me that when they purchased their house, it was an option from the builder oh. as to whether they wanted a sidewalk or not. So if you go through Kensington Park, you'll find some lots of sidewalks, some lots that don't have any. Some will have three houses together with a sidewalk, mm -hmm. two houses with no sidewalk, and then pick up the sidewalk again. That makes so, a lot of yeah. sense. And so when I tried to go to the city to get sidewalks put in, yeah. it's very difficult now to reverse that since that was the original option of some of the homes. Mm. So, yeah. so uh, I bought, last year I bought a split level in 1961 yeah. level in Oakdale. Oh, um, yeah, I know where Oakdale is. Yeah, so Oakdale is just south of Kensington Park. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you know anything about that. I do. Okay. You know, Oakdale, <laughs> Oakdale was actually uh, plotted out in the 1890s. Okay. Kensington was Kensington was actually a farm called Kensington, 
in the 19th century, and then right over Duran was uh, what eventually became Duran was a subdivision called Kensington. And Kensington and then South Gardens, they're both on the corners where those two gas stations are, Duran and um, Waters. Um, those were little, and there's a little bit of a subdivision, you know, remnant over there, South Gardens. Kensington never really did much, the, the subdivision. Um, and in the 50s, it was bought, obviously, and, and made into um, Kensington Park. But Oakdale was actually completely platted out. It was supposed to be, I'm trying to remember, they called them go-ahead neighborhoods. Basically, they're, 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 you take, it was streetcar generated, is what it was. Um, and the streetcar would come down, and uh, believe it or not, Magnolia Park is actually traversed by the original streetcar um, route, and the lane, Lucky, Lovett Lane, yeah, Lovett Lane is actually that, the rail bed. And so it's just, they, they just made it into a lane or something, so it was kind of strange. But, um, but, but it never developed, Oakdale never did develop, and when it, when it finally did, when, when uh, development came in the 50s, I guess they just started selling off the lots as they were. And Is there, I mean, there's, it's not all 1960s, there's a lot of 1980s. Yeah, it, it, didn't, it didn't seem to develop as soon as um, everything else. But. I just haven't been able to, I just haven't been able to. Right, right. I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, well, yeah, I've got all that. Because it has yeah. lanes and everything. Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> and my house is made out of Yeah. Yes, ma'am? I live in Oakdale also, and okay. I live in okay. a bungalow that was built in 1938. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. And it was probably the only house there for a long time because mm -hmm. all the surrounding houses are... Is it on Waters? I'm on Waters and Wheeler on the floor. I know where you are, yeah. yeah. Three lots. Right. <laughs> one block away from me. Yeah. <laughs> and I have something I want to give to you. It's okay. The, uh, the, yeah. the 1940s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, I just had a question about Sullivan Terrace. Uh -huh. So a lot of houses there look like they might be some of the same architects. Yeah. Some building in fairly old schools. Yeah. Houses. The reason why I didn't get into Sylvan Terrace, it really was right around the same time. 1955 was when it was developed. I'm trying to remember who developed it, but it's somebody you're definitely going to know. The, I can't remember the name right now. Um, what's that? Yes, that's him. Sylvan Terrace. <laughs> Sylvan Bick, right? Okay, that would make sense. Um, the reason why I didn't get into that so much is because I was trying to you know, get into the 45 to... 50s development in order to provide the context for the 50s. But yeah, that, that definitely was should be in the same discussion as Fairway X, just because they were contiguous. Right. And it did come a couple of years later, but it was among the first as well. Is it, is it being looked at for It ought to. I mean, it's, I've been through it. It's got beautiful architecture. And, and it does have some track housing that might be a little bit more modern and up uh, cutting edge because it was 50s, 55, not 50 like, like Fairway X. Fairway X has a lot of kind of, I, I, I guess, proto-modern architecture in it, whereas some of these other ones, they were just a couple of years, developed a couple of years later, just has more cutting edge stuff, so, for the design aspect. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Walking around Kensington Park and Fairway Oaks, mm -hmm. it seems to be the, the streets in Fairway Oaks are very narrow. It's impossible to park. I can tell you street. why. Because they didn't have, because right when they were the first ones to get in, and there was no um, ordinance saying that developers had to uh, pave the streets. So let me show you the, the that, so they had no streets, and they had no sewerage. And um, so what happened was Kensington Park, just a year later, had to have streets, sewerage, and everything. So. Their, fair, their homeowners association actually went to each person and said, uh, you're each gonna pay for a por the portion out front of your house and pay for it, and that's what they're doing here. He's, he's, he's filling in each homeowner in front of their house who's paid, and they paved it all themselves, and they did all the, the, the um, uh, surge and everything else themselves. They were dirt roads. And I guess I could say this, because Backus family still around, right? Well, there was one family that apparently refused to pay, and for years it just had a, it just had a. I thought it was funny, but um, eventually they they paved it up. So, it was the principle of it to this person, I suppose. But um, 
Anyway, any more questions? Yes, one question. Um, and not that it has to do with these developments in town, but what about the islands development? Yeah, like there's some early ones, ones as well. Um, Were they developed later? No. Um, all of this happened at the same time, pretty much. So, I mean, a lot of these, when I'm talking about Savannah, I'm really talking about that teeny little area and where you could actually, you could actually walk from Victory Drive. Victory was like the city limits in 1900, then Columbus was, I think, 1940, and then 1950. And so as you walk, you can kind of, it's just an easy way of explaining how things um, progress with Ardsley Park and then, you know, the, the Cold War era stuff. But I think it's Wimberley on the Marsh was 1948, I believe, and that was actually developed by the same guy that developed Fairway Oaks. This Fairway Oaks was his second. So, yeah, I mean, that, some of those are actually earlier. The architecture is not mid-century architecture. That's why when we say, not that it makes it any, you know, but the mid-century, the true mid-century with the ranch houses and, and uh, you know, uh, fallout shelters, hopefully. <laughs> Um, that that would be right right there. So, but yeah, those those early uh, houses, ranch houses, division uh, subdivisions, um, those are significant, and they were happening all at the same time. So, any other questions? All right, thank you.